Let's look at 10 of the weirdest medieval weapons from manuscripts. But before I go on, I just want to mention this video is kindly sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, which is an amazing subscription-based learning resource. But more about that later. I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatoria, the historical fencing club, but I'm also a medieval scholar, um, former archaeologist in fact. And what we're going to look at here are 10 kind of strange or lesser known. I won't say they're unknown, so some of you who are regular followers of my channel will probably know at least half of these weapons. But for those of you who are more novice to the subject of medieval history, some of these might be completely unknown to you. In fact, all of them might be. So we're going to look at 10 weapons from medieval manuscripts that definitely existed in real life um, and that's shown in manuscript art and that really are not known by most people and are pretty weird. So we're going to count these down from 10 to 1, more or less in order of what I think will be the least known by the greatest number of people, or you could say the weirdest. For, so from the least weird to the most weird. So in at number 10, we've got a medieval weapon, which actually, if you think about it, is pretty simple. And that is the wooden spiked club or cudgel. Sometimes they're longer, like a pole weapon or staff weapon. Sometimes they're shorter, more like the length of an axe or a sword. Um, and we find them sometimes used on horseback, sometimes on foot. But they actually turn up quite a bit in medieval art. And the reason that I've included them here is because they don't get talked about an awful lot, even by people who study medieval weapons or medieval fighting systems, HEMA or uh, reenactment, this type of thing. They just don't really get discussed much. And, let, and yet when you actually start looking at the medieval manuscripts, they turn up an awful lot. And when you actually think about it, that's kind of not surprising, because if you think about one of the easiest weapons to make, it's a lump of wood with some nails or spikes hammered into the end of it. And in fact, we see similar weapons to this made in World War I as trench raiding weapons by the troops in the trenches. So all you really need is a piece of wood uh, that you cut to the length that you want it. It could be a long one, it could be a short one, and then you hammer a load of spikes into the end. Uh, and of course, uh, in modern times or in World War One, this was often nails with the flat heads cut off. And I imagine it was probably similar in the medieval period. Often medieval troops were forced to use whatever they had to hand. And so in many cases, they didn't have a suitable weapon. So they thought the best thing I can do here is hammer a load of uh, nails or shanks into the end of a lump of wood. And you go, there's my weapon. And pretty effective as well. I certainly wouldn't want to be hit by one. At number nine, we have a weapon which medieval aficionados will know only too well, but it's not widely known uh, outside of medieval history circles, and that is the flail. Now, the thing about the flail is it's not a weapon at all, actually. And much like many weapons used throughout history and even in the modern world, it's not designed as a weapon originally. Originally an agricultural tool, it was a farmer's tool. And of course, many times farmers were forced to go to war. Uh, um, and they were raised sometimes against their will to uh, fight for the king. And so they used whatever they had available to them. Now, the flail, whilst it is only an agricultural tool, is also a pretty formidable object. It is designed to hit things at the end of the day. So you can hit people just as easily as you can hit crops with it. Um, and we do find in due course, it was such an effective weapon that it was, um, it did in fact get included in the martial arts systems of the day and was included in martial arts treatises. And indeed, there are specialised versions of it, which don't look very much like the agricultural tool anymore, and have iron shod ends um, and iron chains and other types of adaptations to make them more effective for warfare. So sometimes they have spikes on the end, and it actually connects to the previous weapon here of the spiked cudgel or spiked club. And sometimes we find spiked ends on them, uh, which look very much like the earlier spiked club, but with an articulation included. So the flail uh, was uh, used famously by the Hussites as one of the weapons that often found in their war wagons. And it was a weapon which, whilst it may have had humble beginnings, uh, was, um, certainly by the 16th century, used by noblemen in uh, feats of martial arts as well. So it was a respectable weapon in the end. Number eight is a weird weapon which lots of people who study medieval weapons and history might think that they know about, but this is a version of it which is not widely known, and that is it's the backwards falchion. What do I mean by backwards? Well, quite simply, falchions, as most people think of them, tend to have the cutting edge on the uh, curved or, should we say, convex um, side. And when you look at the shape of a falchion, most people expect them to have the cutting edge on that side. However, 
there in the particularly in the 13th and 14th centuries when falchions were really in vogue uh, we do find that some people preferred to have the cutting edge on the other side now falchions uh, their use undoubtedly is related partly to the type of armor being worn at the time and the styles of fighting that were employed perhaps also designed not necessarily to uh, hit into armor but also the less armored opponents that most knights would be fighting against the levies the militias who were not wearing full armor um, but this type of this type of shape of blade they must have found that having it this way around having it on the convex edge for some people was their preference so ultimately it is a conventional weapon the falchion but it's an unconventional version of one it's also unconventional in another way in that occasionally when they're shown in art they're shown with hand guards uh, essentially like a knuckle bow or an early form of a knuckle bow and this is something which is really very rare on medieval swords at this time in at number seven we have what might seem like a very simple object the cleaver and you might say well this is related to the falchion and it may or may not be but the fact is most of these cleavers don't have hand guards they don't have pommels they don't have conventional sword hilts they're more like tools and in fact i believe that that's where they come from i believe that the cleavers that we often see in the hands of knights and other soldiers during the 13th and 14th centuries in manuscripts often originate simply as tools such as butcher's cleavers or in some cases woodworking tools that were simply found to be very effective in warfare because at the end of the day a sharp lump of metal is a sharp lump of metal and it doesn't matter whether it is made for a woodworker or a butcher or indeed a soldier um, so we see very similar items and you'll notice the little notches on the back of the blade these don't seem to have any martial use um, and in fact their tool use is open to interpretation uh, modern butcher's cleavers often have a hole in the back for hanging them on a peg or a hook um, however these are open uh, notches at the back so we don't really know what they were for at least I don't know but the fact is that these probably started off as tools were found to be very effective as weapons and so we see them in medieval manuscripts used as weapons and they're not widely known by people um, who think that they know about medieval history and knights these were important weapons used on the battlefield particularly in the 13th century and to some extent in the 14th century as well in the 14th 14th century we see the rise in popularity of the knightly longsword that is a two-handed sword that can be used in one hand or two hands in fact as well as worn so it's a sidearm but it is nevertheless becomes the the famous knightly sword of the late 14th century that was very popular all the way through to the 16th century but what we find is that swords um, that, adapt, that were adapted at this time for fighting against armor had a lot of challenges because armor at this time was pretty much at its height. In the 15th and 16th centuries, armor became all encasing plate and very difficult to surpass and, and bypass with swords. And so specialized types of swords developed to try and overcome armor or at least optimized for armored fighting. And this is the armored fighting longsword. Doesn't have an official special name, so that's why I'm calling it an armored fighting longsword. And in fact, we find certain adaptations on these swords. We sometimes see spiked or angular pommels, which can be used for striking the opponent like a mace. We sometimes see cross guards that are pointed or even hooked or barbed. And in fact, this is described in text as well. And these are described as being made of hardened steel to try and uh, use them like a warhammer or a pick. And indeed the blades were sometimes blunt for a large portion because they were used in half sorting, that is gripping the blade halfway up the blade and used like a large lever or like a short pole weapon. And in fact, sometimes these blades had specifically an obvious blunted sections and sometimes they even had a hand guard on the blade uh, to protect the gauntleted hand from a point slipping down and underneath the gauntlet and stabbing the hand. So these were specialized armored fighting swords, usually long swords. Sometimes you get one-handed varieties. Again, these are not widely known outside of um, historical European martial arts and perhaps some reenactors, but I think even a lot of reenactors don't know that these were a thing. And there are surviving examples in Vienna um, and in Krakow in Poland as well. So these were definitely a real thing that existed and were used by armored knights as specialized weapons. Now, before I go on, let's talk a little bit about the Great Courses Plus. Now, you probably know a lot about the Great Courses Plus already because it's really famous. Loads and loads of people around the world are subscribed to it. Um, it's a learning resource online. You can watch on all sorts of platforms from TV, phone, uh, tablet, PC, and you can get lectures from top experts on all sorts of subjects. 
The Great Courses Plus is a subscription on-demand video learning service with top-notch lectures and courses from top professors from the Ivy League and other great universities globally, as well as experts from places like National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and the Culinary Institute of America. Through subscribing, you get access to a huge library of over 11,000 video lectures on about just about anything that could interest you, from science to maths, history, le literature, or even how to play chess better. Now, not only have The Great Courses Plus sponsored this video, but they're also offering a free trial link below. Click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. Um, and I personally, I actually really enjoy watching it on my phone. It's a really nice thing to do, last thing at night sitting in bed. Now guys, I don't have to lie to you when I say that The Great Courses Plus is an amazing resource for me, and I'm sure it would be for you as well. The fact is, if you're watching this channel, you like learning about history, culture, perhaps even just learning about weird things that you didn't know about, and you can find all of that and more on The Great Courses Plus. For me personally, it is actually a fantastic resource on a number of very specific topics that I am, uh, I have been in 2020 bringing more to my channel, but I'm gonna be bringing more of in the future. One example of that is Japanese culture. So I don't have a background in uh, talking very much about Japanese weapons or culture, but I do actually have some exposure to Japanese martial arts and Japanese weapons, both antique and replica, and I will be talking more about Japanese warfare in the future. I'm actually watching a lecture at the moment on the rise of the samurai, and I personally actually find the early period of samurai sort of rise to power kind of really, really interesting and less studied than a lot of the later, more famous samurai stuff. The lecturer is Dr. Mark J. Ravina, who's from Emory University. So I really, really want to deal more with the Mongols and how they tie in with Chinese history. As you know, I've been looking a lot more at chi ancient Chinese history um, in 2020 and in the beginning of 2021. I wanna do more and more of Chinese history and how it connects in with the Mongols. And those are a, a connected three things uh, between uh, Mongolian, Chinese, and Japanese history that all link together. And I really, really enjoying learning more about how they interact and how that affects, frankly, their weapons and armor and warfare as well. Now, the really great news is you can do a free trial of The Great Courses Plus right now. The link's below. So please visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash scholargladiatoria. In at number five, we have a very simple weapon, which again is not widely known, and that is the trial by combat pick. Now this does go by various names in period sources, but we have to say we don't have a lot of source material for these. They're not described or shown uh, in many manuscripts, but we know that they existed and we know that they were used for common people uh, like most of you and me um, uh, to have ju uh, judicial duels or trial by combat. So uh, very occasionally in court proceedings, it was decided that the only way to decide the outcome of guilt was to put trust in God and to let God decide through a trial by combat. Now, if you weren't a knight, knights fought in armor, and very often on horseback with lance, sword, poleaxe on foot. Um, but if you weren't a knight, obviously you didn't fight in armor, you couldn't afford armor, no one was gonna lend it to you. You had to have a different way of having a trial by combat. And certainly in many areas in Europe, particularly in England and France, there was a conventional weapon set for common people to do this trial by combat. And it was a large square shield that looked somewhat like a Roman scutum and a pick. Now this pick is described differently in different sources. Some sources describe the end as being made of iron, some describe it as being made actually of antler or horn, so organic materials, and the shaft being of wood. But nevertheless, we know that these were used um, with the shield and they were a conventional weapon set from at least the 12th century through to the 15th century. Um, but very often we find that common things or common people aren't described so much in manuscripts written for nobility and that's the case here. So we don't have a lot of source material, but they definitely existed and they're definitely not a widely known weapon. And they are pretty weird. At number four, we have the dueling shield. Now, they come in many different forms and many different shapes, wild and wonderful, magnificent shapes. Now, anybody who studies historical European like martial arts or a lot of people who do historical reenactment will know about these shields only too well because they are featured in the technical treatises of the day describing how to fight. However, for anyone not studying those treatises, they're practically unknown. Uh, even I would imagine most historical reenactors don't really know what these shields are and have never seen one. 
And they are pretty weird. None of them survive in real life, uh, but they do survive in numerous manuscripts and they are described in text as well. So we absolutely know they were a real thing. They weren't medieval fantasy. And we must admit that some weapons in medieval art are purely fantasy, but these were definitely real things. And they were connected to the legal codes and the trial by combat rules of the day. And you'll see a theme developing here because trial by combat weapons are often weird and wonderful compared to battlefield weapons in the medieval period. So these shields are shown in a number of different uh, treatises, particularly German ones, and they probably have their roots in the earlier square scutum-like um, shield used for trial by combats uh, in England and France, and that was probably used in an earlier period in Germany. But by the 15th century, these shields themselves have developed a very specific variety, and they seem to have had different shapes, different forms in different areas of Germany. Remember, Germany wasn't a unified country yet. It was separate states or essentially dukedoms under the Holy Roman Emperor. And so each uh, dukedom had their own culture, essentially, their own dialects. They had their own designs of weapons, styles of armour and so on. These shields have spikes and hooks. They have a bar up the back. They can be used one handed with a weapon such as a club or a sword, depending which area you're in and the legal code you're under. Or indeed, they can be used two-handed by themselves and used as bludgeoning and stabbing instruments. So, a pretty weird weapon by any measure, uh, by world standards, by historical standards, but also not widely known even by people who read about medieval history. In at number three, we've got a weapon which is actually incredibly simple, but is very, very little known and very little studied. And that's the giant arrow javelin thing. We don't know what to call it. I think the most common word used in medieval and Renaissance sources which relates to this weapon is dart. That's right, most of you when I say dart will think of lawn darts or perhaps darts in the pub. But this, I believe, is what people in the medieval period usually meant when they referred to a dart. It's a giant arrow. Yes, it is literally a giant arrow. It's a javelin for throwing by hand, sometimes with the addition of a loop for the fingers to go through to give a bit more uh, leverage to the throw, a bit like an atlatl, um, but sometimes not, sometimes just thrown like a spear. And it is very clear that these are optimized for throwing because when you add fletchings, that's the feathers on the back, it's for stabilization and therefore range as well. So it means you can throw it further, you can apply a bit more force to it and still have it fly straight straight through the air, and they have giant arrowheads. They have the same types of heads on them that we find on arrowheads, particularly for hunting. Now the question is who was using these? Well, they seem to mostly be in the hands of fairly lightly armoured troops, and there seems to be a geographical bias. So looking at the medieval sources, we see these particularly associated with Spanish and North African. Remember there was a close connection between Spain, or the Iberian Peninsula, and North Africa, and um, Islamic and Moorish culture. It seems to be that there's some connection there. They're also sometimes shown in southern Italy, where additionally we know there's connection with Islamic culture. And also, interestingly, they're shown often in the hands of the Irish, uh, particularly as we get into the 16th century, so really just after the medieval period. So it seems that certain areas and certain cultures who loved throwing spears developed even more specialised throwing spears that look like a giant arrow. Now at number two, we're near the end here, so expect things to get really weird. This is a shield. Now shields are everywhere. Shields are very, very common throughout the medieval period and all the way into backwards into antiquity and all the way forwards actually into the Renaissance. Shields, very, very popular throughout history. But what was not common and which didn't have a particularly long period of use was the face shield. <laughs> what do I mean the face shield? I don't mean a shield for protecting the face. I mean literally a shield with a face on it. And this is something uh, that people who study a lot of medieval manuscripts will know that these are everywhere. Now they seem like a really weird thing and you think that this might be a fantasy thing. Sometimes these medieval manuscripts are telling us about ancient history or biblical um, events and so they might be showing essentially a fantasy object. But these appear from the 13th century right the way through to the 16th century. So they appear over a broad period of time, not hugely commonly, but they appear through a massive variety of sources. So I don't think they can have been a fantasy object. I think they must have been a real thing. People must have put big old fa grotesque faces like gargoyles on their shields. Why? 
We don't know. This is one of the mysteries, and that's why they've definitely made their uh, earned their place at number two in my weird medieval weapons list. And indeed, they're not a weapon in the sense that they're explicitly for hitting people with, but you can hit people with a shield, and they're, yeah, they're basically a weapon. So the medieval face shield, we don't really know why they existed. We don't know if they were regarded as superstitious or special or holy in some way. Maybe they were just like gargoyles and people just liked the look of them. So maybe they were supposed to scare the enemy or distract the enemy. We just don't know. But the fact is they appear all over the place in medieval and renaissance manuscripts. And at number one, we've got something which, again, we come back to trial by combat. Remember I said you find weird and wonderful things used for trial by combat. It's a rock in a sock. That's right. It's pretty much not a weapon. It's pretty much anyone could go and make uh, right now. Go outside, get a rock. Go inside, get a sock. You've got a rock in a sock. And it is a 15th century judicial dueling weapon. Usually uh, for a husband and a wife, uh, if they have a legal dispute, or at least a man and a woman, if they have a legal dispute, to fight. Now, in the medieval mind, uh, these were people who were unequal, and so the man was put in a pit and given a, uh, a club, known often as a mace in the text, but it was essentially a wooden club with an angular shape, particular design for this particular type of judicial duel. Sometimes, incidentally, also used with the dueling shield as well. So it was a judicial dueling club, and the woman got a rock in a sock. Why? We don't know why, but we know that it happened. Again, it's shown in numerous sources, and anybody who studies historical European martial arts and the treatises that are associated with those, then you will know this, and you may have guessed that this was coming at number one. But for any of you who are thinking this didn't deserve number one, remember that anyone who doesn't study those sources probably has never even remotely heard of the rock in a sock and doesn't have a clue that it was a medieval weapon. Um, so there you go. Just goes to show that sometimes the most humble objects can make the weirdest medieval weapons. I hope this has been fun to watch. Again, go and check out those links below to The Great Courses Plus. It's an amazing resource and I am enjoying learning stuff on there, which is really useful for this channel, uh, but also just really useful to me as an individual as well um, for completely th things not related to weird medieval weapons. Um, but thanks a lot for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. Remember to click that notification bell and I'll see you really soon on Scholar Gladiatoria channel again for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.